Good afternoon. Welcome to the Simon Center for the Social Brain Speaker Series. Uh, it's really a, a personal pleasure for me to introduce Kevin Pelfrey today, who will be, who'll give the talk. Uh, uh, Kevin um, did his undergraduate work at North Carolina State, his graduate work at the uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and his postdoctoral work and first faculty position at Duke, which makes him the most conflicted follower of ACC basketball <laughs> I have ever met. Uh, uh, are, Okay, all right, all right. All right. So, he's got, so he'll have to keep secret his, his true allegiance on this. Uh, uh, and a after his faculty position at Duke, he had uh, faculty positions at Carnegie Mellon University, and he's currently the Harris Professor at Yale University School of Medicine and the world famous Yale Child Study Center. Uh, uh, he has uh, approaching 100 publications and many outstanding influential ones. Is a huge figure in our field, is successful uh, and influential really by every metric. But I would say just knowing his papers for years, uh, Two things stand out for me about Kevin's work, uh, and the combination of them I think is extremely rare. First, he's a great cognitive neuroscientist. His experiments are extremely well designed, very savvy in terms of psychology, very savvy in terms of what we know about the brain. And so when you read anything from him, it's completely a prize of everything we need to know to understand the brain and the, and the huge challenge that is. Second, uh, he is thoughtful and savvy about autism as a, as a challenging uh, clinical difference all the issues that go into understanding autism as a difference into thinking about how research relates uh, not only to describing autism but to thinking about it, how to help people with autism. And that combination I think is you know, almost singular uh, in the United States, uh, the combination of cognitive neuroscience, insight and precision of thought and experimental control and the sort of the human element of wanting to make that research to make a difference to, the, to, to a large community. So uh, it's really, and the other thing is, in every interaction I've had with Kevin, not that many, we haven't collaborated that much, uh, but a number across the years, he's an extremely gracious individual. If you call him for advice, help, experimental materials, uh, he, he's extremely gracious in his time uh, and, and generous in, in, in helping other researchers. And so it's, you know, it's really nice when you get to talk to somebody who's both a fantastic scientist and a terrific person. Uh, and so it's really my pleasure to introduce Kevin, who's going to talk about towards a transformative, translational developmental neuroscience. Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me? My microphone working well? Okay. So thank you for the very, very kind introduction. Um, I wish my mother could hear that, and um, I really appreciate it. So I'm delighted to be here. This is my second time at MIT, and uh, it's just fantastic. I love um, this group so much and you know, the way you approach scientific problems. Um, it's very, very, very impressive. And rarely do I make a visit where just every conversation leads me to you know, taking notes and looking up new ideas <clears throat> and thinking about new experiments that I would like to run, as well as collaborations that I would like to, to form. So thank you for hosting me. So in general, our group um, tries to follow this type of pathway in terms of discovery. I've been interested for a number of years in identifying brain functions and their neural and genetic substrates. And in particular, you know, so that's, that's not a small problem at all. Um, but in particular, I'm interested in um, you know, social brain components and the, way in which, the ways in which these components interact and how that gives rise to individual differences. Um, and then I want to understand how individual differences in behavior, particularly as they relate to autism um, spectrum disorder, uh, relate to underlying brain differences as well as genetic substrates. And then, you know, if these two um, uh, components build and, and give us basic science discoveries, I'm interested then in, in taking our group, which has a large clinical component, and trying to translate this basic science into treatment protocols aimed at, at what's um, become very popularly called target engagement. So we're interested, uh, simply put, in taking human participants, um, although we're branching out into animal models, we're very interested in that, but given our skill set, um, human patients and doing um, uh, controlled treatment trials where we're looking at predicting which brain systems we might be affecting and understanding how they're affected over the course of the treatment. If this works, it gives us then the leverage to be able to do um, true uh, evidence-based treatments and rolling them out into a much larger population. And then going back, and you know, this always feeds, and then this becomes a very fertile um, experimental ground 
to be able to, to go back and do, again, basic science, and the process repeats itself. So in a, you know, kind of a broad overview, this is the type of work, um, like many, that we're interested in doing. And so this is a hopelessly out of date slide, but in 2003, this is what I knew about the social brain, and very rapidly became interested in this temporal lobe um, region that, that's called the superior temporal sulcus region, and interested in it primarily spurred from a talk I saw David Parrott give at, at um, Cognitive Neuroscience meeting. He's very interested in terms of doing some early fMRI studies, trying to understand how it was organized. And one of the first ones we did, believe it or not, in 2003, this was high-tech virtual reality. And so a walking guy, a walking <laughs> robot, a control for the form that you see here, but doesn't give you the gestalt of moving, and a control for complex um, uh, nameable motion. And we were interested in, in whether or not the superior temporal sulcus would differentiate this character and this character, the biological motion versus the non-biological motion. And you know, around this time, um, uh, Rebecca Sachs had a beautiful paper showing something very similar. We were able to see that got a beautiful differentiation between um, biological and non-biological motion. And this is old news at this point. But at the time was really fascinating to us in order to build an understanding of the social brain. And I was coming at this from, from purely a basic science point of view. I was trying to, to learn cognitive neuroscience. And this is the type of study that I was doing in order to um, learn these techniques. And so you know, very simple imaging studies by today's standard. <clears throat> and of course, very excited as a cognitive neuroscientist when I saw you know, my, my first functional dissociation and seeing that um, well-characterized regions of MT or V5 were responding to all these different stimuli. So providing a basic understanding of the fact that when visual information is, is coming into the human brain, it's being um, noticed in terms of its biological relevance and it's being processed along two different streams which fit with my developmental understanding that um, infants and young children had different pathways. For, for example, um, the work showing kind of a, a physical understanding pathway cognitively versus a more socially oriented or theory of mind type understanding where you bring to bear different interpretations depending upon characteristics of the stimuli that were coming about at a fairly low level. You know, this is. Um, a high level from the point of view of systems neuroscience, but a low level from the point of view of cognitive psychology. It's the interface between social perception and social cognition. So telling you a lot about that, because it was almost serendipity that you know, I studied biological motion perception. It was, um, I wanted to learn imaging. I had been a developmental psychologist. My mentor, Greg McCarthy, had a study that he was interested in and that we did together, this biological motion study, and I was hooked in terms of the methodology, but it's turned out to be something that I've used over and over again to try to unpack autism. So we had to develop the techniques to scan children with autism, which wasn't trivial because children with autism um, don't really enjoy being put in a loud magnet and being told to stay still. Children in general don't like this. And so we developed a lot of techniques that allowed us to train individual children to be in the magnet and be very, very still. And you know, a few years ago, um, standing in the same spot, I said, you know, we're, we're excited because we've gotten down to being able to scan four-year-olds that are typically developing um, while they're awake and doing a task in the magnet. And we can scan children with autism that are high functioning at age six and above. And now we're at the point, and I'll show you data later, where we're able to scan very young children with autism and at multiple levels of functioning, even children who are, 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 are quite um, nonverbal or minimally verbal and uh, very low IQs and very challenging from a behavioral perspective. And I think you'll be excited about the data I'll present because it's very non-obvious, at least it was to me, um, what the results would be. So <clears throat> we developed the techniques to scan children. And then I had the opportunity, thanks to the Simons Foundation, actually, to um, look at a, a rare group of individuals. So we had the Simons Simplex Collection, which of course had the affected individuals with autism as well as their unaffected siblings. And those unaffected siblings were fascinating because so much work went into ruling out any form of, of autism or developmental disorder outside of that one affected proband, right? 
So that was an exciting control group for me and the sense of these are clearly children that don't have a sub-threshold phenotype. Um, they, they definitely don't have autism. And what that allowed me to do was to um, rule out or, or do in a design where I could separate out what might reflect the underlying genetic liability for autism versus the effects of having autism. So we made this distinction, which is familiar in the, the psychological literature between state and trait and state markers here, defined as regions of dysfunction in children with autism relative to their unaffected siblings as well as other typically developing children without um, uh, siblings with autism, all right? So you can think of this as the state of having autism, right? And now the problem with this is <coughs> even at age four or five, the average age at which we were scanning these, these kids, the differences in the brain that relate to state markers could just as well be the results of having autism for the prior five years as any type of underlying pathophysiology. It's very simple, but it was a conceptual problem. What we were really interested in was trait markers defined as regions of activity reflecting shared dysfunction in unaffected siblings and children with autism. And this is because that came closest to the definition of an endophenotype. And an endophenotype can be a very powerful thing if you want to understand underlying mechanisms and underlying genetic risk. And it can't be attributed to the state of having autism because by definition these unaffected siblings don't have autism and they don't have any other neurodevelopmental disorder. They don't have any subtle um, below threshold uh, form of autism, nor do their parents, which was unique for the Simon Simplex collection. So the design also allowed us to get at what brain developmental processes, what artifacts are left over as, as a result of brain development that avoided the genetic risk of autism and led to a person being an unaffected sibling, even though given the heritability of autism, they uh, are likely to have some underlying genetic liability for this disorder, even in a simplex collection, right? The original notion of the simplex collection was to eliminate the genetic liability and focus on de novo mutations, but that's a natural experiment that can never be perfect. So even though they have perhaps less underlying genetic liability, they still have some. So we used as stimuli something that, you know, I'm a firm believer in if a paradigm works, use it over and over again. We developed this paradigm in an eye tracking study that allowed um, us to look at uh, responses in eye movements to very social, meaningful point light displays versus the scrambled versions of those same displays. And we we're playing this for the children while they're in the magnet and they're seeing a simple block design, um, biological versus scrambled or, or coherent biological versus scrambled biological. I'll use those interchangeably. <coughs> what we saw in the data um, were some things that were not surprising and some things that really blew us away. So focusing first on the red color map. So you have the usual suspects in terms of a social cognition, social perception study, and particularly in autism versus typical development. So remember, these are regions that people with autism have unique hypo functions. So they're failing to differentiate biological and our whole biological versus scrambled biological motion, all right? And those include the fusiform um, gyri, the superior temporal sulcus region, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala. It was bilateral, but I'm just showing it in the, the right slice, um, in the right hemisphere on this particular slice. So none of this was particularly, also, sorry, ventral medial prefrontal cortex um, survived our whole brain control. None of this was particularly new, except that this was in children, and, and that hadn't been demonstrated before. Um, but nothing here that was going to lead us to, you know, more discoveries. It was, it was confirmational. What I think was fascinating for us was the trait regions. So when I first saw them, I was really kind of disappointed because of sort of like dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, more um, forward regions of the, the mid-fusiform gyrus. These aren't, you know, autism hot areas. This isn't regions that you, you really think about as distinguishing autism. And so sort of looking in the literature, um, neurosynth was becoming a thing at this point and trying to understand, well, what do these regions do? 
And in fact, if you started drawing kind of a Venn diagrams of what brain disorders, what psychiatric disorders, had these regions as, as regions of interest in terms of differences versus typical, there was this beautiful, almost complete overlap with all kinds of different brain disorders. So schizophrenia, ADHD, um, Tourette syndrome, OCD, autism, all, and that was very disappointing at first blush. But then the, sort of the question became, well, if you look at the genetics, it's exactly the same story. So every gene that's been identified as a strong candidate gene for autism has been associated with one or more other neurodevelopmental disorders. I, I think it's still the case that there isn't a gene that gives you the autism phenotype and nothing else across the population. So why would there be brain regions that represent the risk for developing autism that are specific, when indeed it might be, especially when you take a static snapshot of four-year-olds, really the only hope you might have is understanding the developmental process by which you have risk genetically for a multitude of neurodevelopmental disorders. It's a surprise that anyone develops normally. And you get to, if we do, and you get to these very recognizable differences in disorders. And I don't have an answer for that other than, yet, other than that this is um, showing up in terms of what we can identify as trait regions <coughs> as um, really interesting um, non-specific findings. So how's that for taking a, you know, basically a null finding and making a story about it? But um, the reviewers believed us. And so what was most interesting to me, though, I fell out of my chair when I saw the green regions. And the reason why is, as a social cognitive neuroscientist, these are regions that I normally think about as kind of high level, more theory of mind, higher level social cognition regions that the unaffected siblings are uniquely using to differentiate biological and non-biological motion. And it's incredibly tempting to think about that as what they're doing, instead of doing this early process of, of differentiating biological and non-biological motion, to get to the same behavioral end, they're using quite high level regions, um, one of which being in this department we'd be very familiar with. This is getting dangerously close to the right temporal parietal junction, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which um, several of, of the faculty here have been leaders in understanding what lesions in that region do and what function it has using neuroimaging. And so strongly associated with high level social cognition. And so you see the patterns in the beta values here, very much uniquely differentiating biological and non-biological motion in unaffected siblings. And I um, was tempted to call these compensatory regions. I was quickly reminded that I don't have any evidence from a knockout study that these are compensatory regions. And I'm, pr I'm happy to report that we just got approval in adults with autism to knock out, uh, sorry, unaffected sibling adults, to knock out via TMS these um, uh, processes in order to try to understand their effect on the perception of biological motion. So it was an interesting H I a IRB to write to say, you know, I want to kind of make people temporarily see things in an autistic way. Um, but I think that then we'll have evidence for compensation. But until then, I've been tempted to call them compensatory. Whenever we want to understand um, uh, an endophenotype or a biomarker, and there's an important distinction between the two, but by and large, I'll use them interchangeably. Of course, it needs to relate externally to some form of behavior. And in this case, <clears throat> what we and many others see is that these brain regions that we're interested in, like the superior temporal sulcus of the fusiform, beautifully relate to um, more realistic world measures of, of social impairment, like the social responsiveness scale. I've actually been very impressed with John Constantino's social responsiveness scale in terms of being very simple, but carrying so much variance in both genetic and brain imaging studies. I think that you know, his sort of long expert, clinical expertise is really playing out well in terms of um, developing a measure that's just been a gold mine. So what I'm showing here is simply a very strong correlation between uh, measures of, of the differentiation between biological and non-biological motion and these regions of um, uh, uh, this score on the SRS. And, and being at MIT, I will point out that this is independent data. I'm not making the double dipping mistake. So the big, probably unfortunately, the big question 
for a while in autism and other neuropsychiatry um, work with imaging was, you know, can you, do you have a diagnostic measure? Can you diagnose autism with imaging? And some of you look at me like that's a crazy notion. It kind of is, but we, all of us imagers were really excited about this for quite a while. And, and there were claims of being able to diagnose autism and with six, six dimensions or three or, you know, one response from language areas and via anatomical and diffusion sensor. When you look at those papers, though, <coughs> in every case, they utilized some beautiful machine learning algorithms um, or even very simple statistics to um, identify a, a biomarker, or a brain region, a, re a region of interest, and then run an analysis where they say, you know, what's the receiver operating um, characteristic? Um, you know, and being at MIT, that one's particularly meaningful having been developed here. And so you have these ROC curves and you show that, look, you know, I have incredible sensitivity and specificity. And this has been done across a variety of techniques in um, cognitive neuroscience. Eye tracking, there are some very weighty papers claiming to have early diagnostic markers using autism in great journals uh, using eye tracking for autism that are essentially making the same logical error that other forms of, of, of this and imaging are making, which is you define an ROI based on a population, and then you show that within that population you can reliably differentiate autism and controls. And it's just a simple, silly mistake. Because you have a way overinflated estimate of what your sensitivity and specificity are, you haven't done the key step of trying it in a new population. And believe it or not, there are a variety of papers that did exactly that and nonetheless were still published. So we tried to do this with a replication cohort, a discovery cohort with our biological motion task and then a replication cohort. And so what I'm gonna show you is an fMRI result, which is a pretty rare thing in autism to have one replicate. And here's one that's a, that's a replication. It's not independent, it's still our group, but it's a new cohort. We use some um, machine learning algorithms, classification um, schemes to parcelate the brain and try to understand which um, voxels best classified um, autism from control and then apply that information um, to a new sample. And um, we were able to find um, things that were, were somewhat um, surprising, mostly confirmatory. You notice uh, very nice, um, posterior STS fusiform findings suggesting beautiful sensitivity and specificity for boys with autism. Um, even though we had a large number of girls with autism in this study, our classifier, trained up on boys and girls, did a terrible job of diagnosing autism in girls, quote unquote, diagnosing autism. I'm still making a very inflated claim because I haven't, for example, compared autism and ADHD, can I distinguish between two disorders? And before any diagnostic technique um, would be useful, of course you would want to at least distinguish between two things that any clinician could tell you if the person was in their office for five minutes differ dramatically. No neuropsychiatry study to my knowledge has done that with imaging or any other technique. So <coughs> I can't even reliably diagnose autism in 50% of the general population um, and in, you know, a smaller percentage of the autistic population, but a very important uh, percentage of that population. So, uh, I feel like I need to summarize and put it in simpler terms. Good job, social brain tells you a lot about autism in boys, tells you very little about autism in girls. That's really interesting because autism is much more rare in girls and about the time that we were seeing this in our imaging data, publications in genetics were coming out that suggested the genetics of autism is different in girls. And in fact, it takes a greater burden to get to the phenotype. There's probably a problem in terms of how we diagnose autism in girls. And um, the concept of what autism should look like in girls. And that's, I always get quizzical looks, but what if the underlying brain circuitry disruption, the problem, manifests in very different behaviors in girls? Perhaps it looks more like an eating disorder, for example than what we see as autism in boys, but the underlying brain process is one and the same, right? I don't have evidence for that, but I have strong suspicions. And those strong suspicions and the genetics data led us to propose <coughs> a very large study of girls. So this is, 
an autism center of excellence. Every about five years, there's a competition at NIH for these. And we put together sites that were well positioned along the um, Simon Simplex collection sites. So we had a, a UCLA site, a Seattle site, um, uh, Boston Children's, and Yale. Um, and looks like I don't know where Yale is, but believe it or not, that's supposed to be Yale. And, uh, um, and we were able also to, to put in money to fly patients from the Midwest girls because they're rare, they're hard to find. And we leveraged the Simon Simplex collection where they'd already identified a large number of girls to help us reach our goal of getting 250 boys with autism, 250 typically developing boys, well-matched, IQ, all the, the usual things. Girls with autism, 250, which would be the largest sample of girls ever assembled, and then 250 typically developing girls, and then half girls, 400 siblings, to allow us to study what may be the most important group of people, which is female siblings of people with autism. I think that they could tell us worlds about compensation and protective factors that could then lead to new discoveries for treatment at multiple levels of analysis for boys with autism and girls with autism. So total sample, we're well on our way. And what everyone across these different institutions is getting, um, our data coordinating center is Lonnie, which moved from UCLA to, to Southern California in the, in the middle um, of the study. And everyone is getting genetic um, structure data, so whole genome sequencing, gene expression data from blood, um, methylation analysis for a few key candidate genes, um, fMRI, structural MRI, DTI, magnetic resonance spectroscopy on, on all of these patients. So we have this, and then of course the Simons version of the workup, so a very detailed phenotype. And so just to present a little bit of data from this, this is an ongoing study and we hope to be publishing the first papers coming out of it in the next year, we're working on it now. <clears throat> but the very first set of findings carrying forward the theme of biological motion, it's been argued that the genetics of um, uh, female autism, girls with autism, and the genetic distribution as well as the difference in, in, in incidence rates in autism between boys and girls lead to the conclusion that there's likely to be what geneticists call a Carter effect or a protective effect to being female. Um, and so we wanted to know, well, what's the, the functional brain expression of this protective effect? And there are very well-known sex differences in just about every brain system that you might be interested in, but especially social brain systems. So it's not a surprise that girls with autism might show some of these differences versus boys with autism. In particular, girls in general tend to have stronger function in the social perception system, although there's wide individual variability and overlapping distributions. But on average, they, for example, respond more strongly in the superior temporal sulcus to biological versus non-biological motion. So the first comparison we made was between girls with autism and boys with autism. And quite beautifully, we saw the circuit that we're always interested in, and we've been studying for many years, that's involved in processing biological motion, and it was much stronger for girls with autism versus boys with autism. So first piece of evidence that they might have um, a protective factor in their social brain system leading potentially to the differences you see in terms of phenotypic expression. But one of the most interesting comparisons would be comparing girls with autism versus typically developing girls. And so this is a key comparison because now girls versus girls, and we're seeing much stronger activation in a system, again, that both is involved in, in tagging stimuli with relevance and reward value and social motivation, as well as systems involved in interpreting those stimuli at a pretty high level in terms of social cognition. So we were excited about this because you have girls who meet the diagnostic criteria for autism. They show social deficits, they show language deficits, they show ritualistic and repetitive behaviors. We had to struggle to match them on IQ because on average they also show more intellectual disability. And they seem to have gotten to this diagnosis with very different brain systems being affected. And they're walking around, um, perhaps an overinterpretation, but with something that seems terribly sad, a very strong, active social motivation system, but yet completely lack 
the skills required for these successful social interactions to happen. So they have lots of desire for it to happen and very little skill to make it happen, which is a recipe for anxiety, depression, eating disorders, externalizing, dis internalizing disorders, that what you tend to see in much higher rates of comorbidity with girls with autism. So um, this is our, our kind of first evidence for what is a protective factor, but also probably something that sets them up for a much greater risk for other disorders as they transition into the teen years and early adulthood. And we're studying these girls in the pre-teen years. We're hoping that over time we'll be able to follow them longitudinally and study that transition to understand both how this might protect many girls from developing autism that have the underlying genetic risk, but how it might lead those same girls at a later point in life to develop other psychiatric disorders that can be equally um, uh, debilitating. So. Um, we've been collecting resting state data, and I wanted to show you, show you this. So um, you could argue that everything I've been, I've been talking about is biased from my interest in, in social brain and social perception and social cognition, and that's a very fair point. Maslow said, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So this is resting state data, so no kind of preconceived theoretical notion. This is as atheoretical as it gets. And when we look at resting state data, and we simply look at cross correlations across the brain, across various systems that have been of interest in resting state data, as well as simply doing literally cross correlations against all voxels, we get on average relatively normal resting state patterns. We, we hit all the major resting state networks that people are interested in, um, in both boys and girls with and without autism. But when we compare girls and boys um, with without autism to, to match typically developing individuals, we see different networks emerging of dysfunction. And so what I've done, this is kind of a crazy thing. So I took the networks activation maps of differences that we had between um, boys with autism versus typical boys, girls with autism versus typical girls. And I um, put them into um, uh, Neurosynth, which is an online, um, database that you give it your activation map and it tells you from polling all the different imaging studies that it's included what those networks might be. So it's basically empirical reverse inference, all right? And what comes out is differences in systems that have been implicated in anxiety, emotion regulation, uh, comprehension, language comprehension. Um, both in comprehension and language, both in boys and girls without autism, but notice the differences here in terms of the factor loadings on these different latent constructs. Again, this is suggesting from the resting state data that autism from the point of view of resting state networks in the brain is a different beast for boys and girls with autism. And um, you know, because everyone loves wordles, here's a wordle of it. So the things that are most relevant from a neural systems point of view um, in, in imaging resting state data for girls versus boys with autism. That was striking to me because again, if we're designing a diagnostic instrument based mostly on samples of boys, we might well be missing what's most relevant for girls with autism in terms of diagnosis, especially given that this is the, the worst possible position to make this comparison. So if anything, it's underestimating the differences between boys and girls because the girls have already gone through the gauntlet of obtaining an ADOS you know, and an ADI diagnosis, which many are beginning to argue is heavily skewed towards understanding autism in boys versus girls. Okay, so Leaving the boy-girl differences for a moment, let's kind of go back and we'll say, all right, so we've found something that we think of as biomarkers. Can we use that in order to then manipulate experimentally brain function on autism and see if we can engage some of these biomarker targets? And one of the first studies we did was a study of oxytocin. And to be frank, I, I did this study more as a way to kind of disprove the number of um, concerns I had about parents using oxytocin as a, as a chemical intervention, and they were buying it on Amazon.com. They were spending a lot of money. Um, just so you know, if you buy it off of Amazon.com, by the time it reaches your door, if it ever had any oxytocin in it, it doesn't anymore. Um, you know, there's instability. 
and probably it didn't have any to begin with. But um, when we wanted to know if we gave it in a controlled, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, could we see differences in brain activation? So we used a task from Simon Baron Cohen's lab that had been used before in oxytocin studies behaviorally, but no one had done this in imaging with kids with autism. And so the task is to look at the eyes and say, you know, which of these emotions, and so probably worried fits best here. And then we designed a new complicated task, which was reading the type of car in the headlights. We just wanted something to compare. Um, this probably contradicts your compliment about experimental design, but we just couldn't think of anything else. So um, we didn't want to do age judgments, is what's typically done. And so we had something non-social and a judgment, um, but you know, equally complex, maybe. So then we gave oxytocin or placebo. Each patient received both, and it was double blind. And so this is the same set of patients getting oxytocin viewing mind in the eyes versus the, the car tasks, so social versus non-social, versus um, placebo. And so instantly you kind of see this difference in activation in a lot of the regions that I've been talking about, amygdala, superior temporal sulcus, um, uh, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. But of course, you know, picture side by side isn't a direct comparison. This is regions showing a task by drug interaction. And so what you see is, um, I, I hope exciting in the sense of you're seeing increased activation to eyes and importantly decreased activation to vehicles in these regions that are involved in coding social reward reward in general as well as some of the very same social perception regions that I've been talking about. Um, you know I've, I've neglected the cerebellum. I have a student Allison Jack who by the way is on the job market and she is an aficionado of the cerebellum. I've always thought of it as not really part of the brain, but you know, it does something. And so um, she has shown repeatedly that the cerebellum is, is non-trivially involved in social perception and social cognition. And so to point that out, because I never really noticed that before in our results, um, we were writing the paper and talk about it, but Actually, you see some beautiful cerebellum effects in the portion of the cerebellum that if you get a lesion there, you actually can't perceive biological motion. So, um, yeah, so we're seeing this effect. And, and what was interesting about it was a dual effect where you ramp up the response to the eyes and decrease the response to the vehicles. We wanted to make sure that wasn't just because it has to be, because we were looking for interactions. So we did a number of things to kind of explore this. And over and over again, we were seeing that. Um, so this decrease, sometimes the, the decreased response was even stronger than the ramping up the response to the social, to the preferred stimulus. And so we kind of keep that in mind as I move forward. Um, another aspect of this that we think, so, so one mechanism that we think oxytocin is, is responsible for is increasing the response to the socially meaningful stimulus in these regions of interest involved in processing that category of stimulus, decreasing the, the response to the non-social, which is abnormally high in autism, but also in terms of affecting this dopamine pathway that's involved in coding the reward value. And so as evidence for that, these are two other paradigms. Um, I think this is unpublished at this point, but this is um, a, sample of, a new sample of individuals and now we're looking at different paradigms where we do affective voices and we look at functional connectivity between the amygdala and between the nucleus accumbens and every other point in the brain and try to understand what connectivity patterns oxytocin is affecting. And what it tends to affect is connectivity between these reward regions and regions involved in processing the category of stimulus, the, the basic features of the stimulus. Um, as you would expect with this biological motion paradigm as well as this affective voices paradigm. So again, kind of hold that in mind as we go now away from pharmacology and into behavioral intervention. And so here, we're interested in applying a, a, a form of, of applied behavioral analysis, um, pivotal response training. This is a very intensive intervention. This is Pam Ventola, who's the clinical director for my group. And she's a clinical psychologist who's been trained in, in pivotal response training. And this is her actually doing a therapy session. So this is fun stuff. So we do 16 weeks of intervention with these kids who are four or five years of age. 
um, diagnosed with autism, and they're verbal enough to be able to take part in this type of um, uh, intervention, which relies a lot on naturalistic settings, a lot of ABA principles. Um, it's very similar to the Early Start Denver model, if you're more familiar with that one. Um, and it's an empirically supported behavioral intervention. It doesn't work for all kids, but it works for some kids with autism. 16 weeks of training, about between eight and 10 hours per week, um, including parent training to help the parents implement some of these same principles, as well as intensive one-on-one work, one -on -one work with the children, okay? So we're interested in, um, this is just showing you that the, the uh, breakdown of, of the sample. So we had 24 individuals at this point, um, between four and six, I should say, actually. <coughs> and we give PRT, and unsurprisingly, they improve um, because this is a known empirically supported intervention. And our, our primary outcome measure is the social responsiveness scale, which I mentioned earlier, as filled out by um, a parent and a, another caretaker. And so you see overall a very beautiful um, response on average to this intervention for the group. And you see the different components of the SRS where these gray bars add up to this red one, okay? So showing clinical improvement is my only point there. Um, our task, of course, was biological versus non-biological motion. And what we found, um, two aspects to this, two different PRT studies that we've done at this point. One of them was to understand what happens when you give PRT and you look at differences in brain response pre, and pre versus post, okay? So what changes as a result of treatment? And the answer depends on how the kids present to begin with in, in what I think are very interesting ways. So this relates to something Rebecca and I were talking about before this, where both of us have a strong suspicion that most of the findings in functional imaging and autism are um, driven by small sample sizes. You have a large enough sample size, a lot of these social brain differences tend to go away. So we had a largest sample, and we thought, well, if we were to divide these groups up, because um, a very talented research faculty member, Daniel Yang, noticed what appeared to be really two groups of people. One that showed this classic hypoactive response in the social brain, and then one that was really showing strong response to everything um, that we could present visually in this biological motion task and others. And you know the key difference between uh, them versus typical was one of hyperactivation. So we started digging into these groups and trying to understand, well, what differs as a function of group membership and do they differ behaviorally? So we interviewed the um, clinicians without telling them what we were up to and we elicited narratives and they tended to categorize this group as classic autism and this group as really emotionally dysregulated kind of hyper um, and sensory um, uh, laden autism or words that came up. So these were the kids that clinically had a lot more sensory issues and emotion regulation issues. These were kids that were pretty easy to manage in the world of autism and very classic, um, you know, unsocially motivated. No difference in sex here, um, but we had very few girls. So when we did the pre-post comparisons, what changed, everyone, um, well, everyone, the group average became normal in both groups, so to speak. So relative to typically developing in a group that responded to a behavioral treatment and improved their behavior, we took away baseline differences. And what seemed to be related in each case, or in, in the hypoactive case, was changes to increase activation in this system that I've talked about in terms of reward and social motivation versus in the hyperactive group, decreasing activity in th thalamus and functional connectivity between the thalamus and regions of association cortex. So depending on your biotype coming into treatment, you had different um, mechanisms from the point of view of targets that changed as a result of getting the same treatment. And what we're excited about for this is, well, what if we had that knowledge ahead of time? Could we tailor the treatments and deconstruct them in a way so we specifically target the individual child's issues just by knowing a little bit about this? And I, but at the same time, I've already given away that the clinicians already had a clue based on, you know, they could 
put these two groups into these categories. So this isn't a case where you need imaging. But it's a case where imaging is telling you something interesting, even though you get the same behavioral difference <coughs> on your outcome measure. If you're designing a drug or you're designing a very targeted treatment as opposed to kind of a broad spectrum antibiotic behavioral intervention, then knowing this versus this could be very, very useful. So as we've progressed with this work, I pulled this off from train ride yesterday. I like the title, Imprecision Medicine. What stunned me about this, this was in a recent issue of Nature. Um, what stunned, not my paper, or I wouldn't be <laughs> bragging, but shorts. So, um, but yeah, what stunned me is this commentary where all of these blockbuster drugs, this is the number of people you go through before you get a hit. And you know, this one in particular, um, I know lots of people that have had bad side effects there. Almost all of these have some pretty terrible side effects. And man, you know, Nexium, you're taking a lot of people before you get one that act, for whom it actually works. So, and all of them are expensive. So wouldn't it be great to know for whom, and, and he picked these examples because many of them have underlying genetic understanding now where you can begin to pick individual people. So in psychiatry, of course, we would love to know for whom pivotal response training would work. We would love to have a biomarker of that. We would love to know for whom oxytocin would work, um, you know, and on and on and on, list your favorite intervention. So what we did was look at our data from the point of view of which brain regions predict improvement and degree of improvement in outcome um, from baseline to post. And what we found was three clusters. Um, one being the right orbital frontal cortex, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, extending into the insula, where a paper by, by Ben Dean has shown that that portion of the insula is also involved in emotion regulation from resting state data. Our friend, the right um, superior temporal sulcus, uh, middle temporal gyrus fusiform, and this region of the amygdala ventral striatum hippocampus. So regions that I've gone over in terms of their function are very striking in that what this says is if you have greater differentiation between biological and non-biological motion, increased social perception activity, in these brain regions at baseline, you're going to have a better outcome as a result of pivotal response training. And this is showing you um, uh, the, the form of the association. And one cluster isn't any better than the other. Each one of these clusters would do a fine job in terms of predicting your level of improvement. So, what was striking about this is that in this sample of individuals getting PRT, when we lumped everyone together and looked at what changed pre versus post, bearing in mind the issue with the biotype, but this is summing over that component, we have um, regions that are different in terms of what changes with treatment versus what predicts response to treatment. And I don't know about you, but that surprised me in the sense of, you know, of trying to understand how to go after neurodevelopmental disorders, I would have thought that the regions that change with treatment might be the same ones that predict response to treatment, but that's not the case in our data. So we're able to say which kids would benefit at baseline from pivotal response training. And you know, I would note, um, using imaging, and I would note that you know, our clinicians were very clear with us that they, they would have never been able to do this clinically. And in fact, the original SRS score, language, the self scores, Vineland's IQ, sex, SES, commitment of parents, nothing else predicted success. The brain did. And any combination of all of those behavior and clinical factors. So this is an area where imaging would indeed seem to be of help in terms of predicting for which kids you have the greatest response given this very expensive, um, uh, elaborate behavioral intervention. And if you put this data back with the oxytocin data, then the very, um, I think, the very exciting possibility emerges of what if you could ramp up this system so that every child that comes in, if a potential candidate for PRT, but they don't have the starting point that you need, could you give them the oxytocin in order to ramp up the system that we know is ramped up in both typically developing people and people with autism and then start the pivotal response training? And you know, all of this is, 
hard to, for me to wrap my head around in the sense of this is not how FDA clinical trials are designed, nor are they designed to be sensitive at all to any developmental issues. But if we're going to do clinical trials of autism, this type of thinking has to be employed and we have to, to change our strategy for doing this so that you can have this type of, of combination and outcome measure. Okay, so sorry being a little bit preachy. Um, the last things I want to show you, and I apologize in advance, some of these films are, are quite um, depressing. Um, actually, is there any way we can turn off the camera for this part? Okay. I appreciate it. I have um, uh, twin pairs where one twin had regressive autism, one twin had uh, regular autism. So we thought, well, that's going to be, you know, home run. No, nothing like that. No obvious things. But when we did this type of gene co-expression analysis, I'm showing you the nod sestins data here from Jeremy uh, Wellesley's paper um, using the nod sestins um, database. And what you know, has been uh, shown and commonly accepted and replicated is that in um, broad autism, broadly defined, so um, Simon simplex collection and others, that you have differences once you do this co-expression analysis in sets of genes that are involved in um, uh, brain development in mid-fetal development period in the prefrontal and primary motor somatosensory cortex. That was a major discovery back in 2013. When we did the same analysis in autism, and we had to do a funny trick here that I'm still not sure how I feel about. We needed something to seed this. And there was a lot of overlap between the genes we were seeing as candidate genes, potential hits, in our CDD data versus um, those in the uh, uh, in autism in general, non-regressive autism, I should say. And so we used the, the candidate genes and, and we seeded this. And what we found was a different period, um, a later period of development in terms of, uh, but also in the fetal period, and genes that were expressed in, in clusters that were related to the thalamus, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and cerebellum. So different place and different timing for regressive, late regressive versus, versus non-regressive autism. You know, and, and, but from the point, remember, from the point of view of behavior, the DSM-5 codifying this, these kids are no different. But from the point of view of the underlying system's biology, it appears to be a different disorder. And one that has a different hit, different sets of hits in different places at different times. Okay, um, this is showing essentially the same thing, but in terms of um, looking at neocortical versus non-neocortical uh, and looking at genes that are either protein coding or not, and showing you that when you look at the, um, the non-coding, uh, non-protein coding genes, you're seeing a difference, but you're not seeing a difference in the, the non, it's a control, the non-protein coding. Um, and this is recapitulating this point about in terms of when and where in behavior different brain regions that we have from the non sestins database and then the genes that we found where are the hits. And there's a tantalizing second hit that's actually quite late in, in post-fetal development, the, the, the period, the demarcation there of birth, showing that actually around the school age period you're getting another bump up in when these genes are expressed. It's tantalizing but non-significant. Again, though, this is a rare disorder. You know, we've, we've tried to publish this paper. It's been frustrating because, you know, we're told that a sample of 16 or so with, with this data is not enough, you know, and it's kind of like, well, you know, I have to study 30,000 more people to get another 16, and so actually a lot more than 30,000. Um, but nonetheless, now here, this kind of blew me away. So I've always assumed that if I were to take low functioning kids, very disabled kids, and put them in the magnet versus what we've all been studying, which is high, higher functioning kids with autism, very verbal kids with autism with high IQs, that we would just see a greater um, uh, example, a more severe example of the same disruption. So this is just identifying the fusiform face area. This is the classic finding, typical development versus high functioning ASD. This is taking from an independent sample of typical development, faces versus houses, looking at the fusiform across the different forms of autism. So we have high functioning autism. We have a group of low functioning autism without regression, right? Which is, a, you know, a, a, again, 
This is a first picture, I think, of low functioning kids being scanned on a cognitively relevant task. And what it's showing you is that they don't show the classic fusiform finding, nor do the CDD kids. They actually have, and, and at first it was quite disappointing, sort of PSTS, fusiform, other findings on the social brain that we've had in the high functioning individuals, it's not showing up in the low functioning individuals. And what they seem to be showing, and um, again, that surprised us was other brain regions that are responsive, highly responsive to faces that uniquely identify them. So this is the CDD kids, those with um, regression. The reviewers told us we couldn't use the term CDD because it didn't exist anymore. So we had to call it ASDR or, or ASD with regression. So those kids are showing a unique pattern of activation in the thalamus and, and the cerebellum cortex, which before today, I actually saw Ben Dean's beautiful um, developmental data in infants that are awake and, and behaving in the magnet, um, or awake and, and, yeah, behaving is a good term for it, being still. Um, before today, I was very tempted to liken this to kind of Mark Johnson's idea about an early subcortical system that processes faces. And you'll see why in just a moment when I show you the eye tracking data. <coughs> but because this is some of the regions that he describes as the potential underlying source, although you know, he didn't have the information. But it looks like in infants, indeed, they have this beautiful cortical system for processing faces. So although I guess the timing, the timing's not quite right. So your, your babies are three months old. Yeah. And so you know, it's actually past that developmental period that Mark Johnson talks about. So this interpretation still holds. They seem to have an archaic underlying system that's still in place. Um, that uh, you know, has, has survived this regression and perhaps has been uncovered by this regression. And it seems to be related to their visual scan path. So this was an early study using eye tracking. Um, this kind of got me into the field of autism, using eye tracking to show what you know, every good clinician could tell you, which is people with autism don't look at the eyes. And this is the same type of data, but from our new sets of samples, all right? So a few things are really interesting. Um, by the way, this was the five individuals with autism I could find as a graduate student um, that are high functioning and, and well known to the Chapel Hill community where I was trained. And so they were very high functioning people um, showing this, this failure to look at the eyes. All right, this is high functioning autism versus typical development. So I'm just replicating my old finding. Ami Klenz replicated it many times, other groups as well, Jerry Dawson. So this isn't surprising at all. What was surprising is that low functioning autism, um, they have preserved this difference between looking at the eyes versus the mouth. It's of the same magnitude as the typical development. It's this difference that all of us talk about, um, not the absolute magnitude of looking at the eyes. So they have a very normative way of looking at the eyes, even though they spend less of their attention overall on core facial features. So low functioning, um, I should say minimally, minimally verbal, low IQ. Right? Low functioning is, is really not a good char characterization. But um, these patients that have been not um, studied very often don't follow what is being argued as one of the key biomarkers or early diagnostic indicators. So to the extent that eye tracking is an early diagnostic indicator, it's an early diagnostic indicator of this group of individuals versus this one and tells you very little about this group apparently. And then of course the CDD data, they love looking at the eyes almost more than the typically developing individuals. And it fits with this clinical characterization. They don't get scored on the IEDOS as lack of eye contact for the absolute amount of eye contact. It's the quality. A good clinician knows the difference between like a stare through you versus using eye contact socially. They tend to kind of stare through. You know, and I, I think of this as very young infants who might well um, have a bias towards looking at the eyes, but it's driven subcortically and it helps set up these, these regions for development that, that emerge later to take over truly social looking. If, if Mark Johnson's right, they seem to be doing something like that. Um, so again, and we want to follow this up with brain experiments where we're doing imaging and eye tracking, but it, all this becomes technically very, very, very challenging. Okay, so the last thing that I want to show you, aware that I'm running out of time,
is simply the ways in which um, uh, the um, data that we've been collecting on older children with autism can be translated down to younger and younger infants. Um, and so I'm inspired by Ben's work here. I know it took forever to get this going, really impressive. And we've been doing infant scanning, but while the babies are asleep. So we've been using um, socially meaningful information like, which is biological motion versus other environmental sounds and speech sounds versus not. And then we've been doing awake babies with, with optical imaging. And so and that's my son, Well, He was our first subject. Unsuccessful though. And this was our first successful subject. It's actually an unusual successful subject in that she was almost 12 months old. It's actually really challenging to scan that age range. She woke up and right after that she started screaming and crying. So, you know, we were able to show, this is Sarah Schultz's work. She's at Emory now as an assistant professor. And she was able to show these beautiful differences between speech and, and non-speech um, information walking along this, this system in the spiritual sulcus that, that responds to human speech, nears, wouldn't surprise you that we're using biological versus non-biological motion. We seem to have an early indication of a marker of potential risk here, where when we're looking over this right temporal lobe, in and around where you would expect to be seeing um, STS function, and of course this is optical imaging using near-infrared light, we're seeing a beautiful differentiation between biological and scrambled motion in the low-risk babies, and it's, it's lateralized right versus left. And then we're not seeing that in the high-risk babies. But what's striking about this is, um, I'm trying to remember, so this is three-month-old data, and now all of these babies have, in this group, have progressed to being able to be diagnosed. And I think I can say confidently that either one or zero ended up with autism, right? Diagnosable autism, now at 24 and then at 36 months. So it's old data. So, you know, what's up with that? Well, it's suggesting that you've got the risk and then developmental processes unfold and you miss the diagnosis, but the risk is still detectable. And it's a little bit of a warning sign. You know, it's like, what if I put all my resources into something like this, which apparently does a terrible job of actually predicting, but you know, shows a beautiful difference very early on. And anyone in the room that's an expert on early autism knows they bounce all over the place behaviorally. And it's not just measurement error. They truly you know, move around, especially these high-risk babies. And so not so surprising that a sample, I believe this was 20 infants. And so yes, 20 would be one you might expect to, to come out with autism at a, you know, with, with um, a high risk sample. And one last thing, a sort of a soapbox thing. I think it's incredibly important to study um, high risk samples, uh, high risk autism samples by virtue of, of being related, baby sibs. But as far as developing a diagnostic marker, unless you're developing a diagnostic marker, for high-risk infant siblings, which your best diagnostic marker would be, does your other child have autism? <laughs> I'm going to refer them to birth to three. You know, just, just be safe. That's, that, that's all you really need as a pediatrician. I'm not a pediatrician, but that's where I would go because, you know, things like this, eye tracking, if I were to show you sensitivity and specificity, in this case it would be terrible even if I could predict outcome later on in infant um, uh, uh, siblings. My population rate is so high that unless I hit perfection in the actual real world, it's going to be around chance. And so if you kind of work out the statistics of that, if the population, if the population you're studying, the base rate is 20%, and you can do it well, but you still haven't shown ability to differentiate autism from any other disorder, when you apply that to every doctor's office out there, you're going to be more or less at chance. And then you've really got to look at the risk to the population of over-diagnosing, over-indicating a red flag, especially when a little bit of clinical acumen combined with does your other child have autism would be plenty and, and do just as well. So um, I think that the most interesting thing about the infant sib studies is understanding how kids 
that have the genetic risk avoid autism. And that's when we're talking about actually trying to alter developmental trajectories. And I realize I purposefully ended on something that's very controversial and I don't have many like-minded colleagues, but I feel like we all ran very rapidly and with incredible resources to infant SIB studies and the outcome has actually not been that great and might be quite specific to infant SIBs, which is you know, a particular population. Okay, so I want to acknowledge um, the different funding sources. I've been incredibly fortunate to have the support of the Simons Foundation um, and, and NMH, the Simons Foundation um, gave me my first you know, real grant and so I really appreciate being particularly at this um, uh, talk series and also I'm just the front person for a great group of people. Most of these people are students in the lab, several of whom are on the job market like Allison Jack um, and Nicole McDonald and so um, yeah I just want to highlight those folks and I'll stop there and hopefully still have time for questions. Yes. Differentiated from others because yeah. they were worried, so let's try all these kind of things. We'll teach this. If another baby tries it, another variable which may have yep. the diagnosis. So let me repeat the question. So if you um, uh, say to you know a family, which ethically we have to say, if we have any suspicion, you know, any, any types of behavioral signs, not based on FNIRS data or eye tracking data, but you know, suspicions clinically. There might be something going on here. They already know because they've enrolled in a study where their other, um, the other child has autism. We say, you know, there's a concern. Yes, they're absolutely going to start trying just about everything. In Connecticut, we have to refer them to birth to three. So they're starting to get resources immediately. And it's going to wreak havoc on our nice experimental design. Um, because ethically we can't do anything else and they're going to try all kinds of stuff some of which is going to work and we will ask them about all that and try to covary it but now we need samples of thousands because there's going to be dozens of things tried and um, parents and anyone who is a parent knows why are notoriously bad at remembering all the different things they've tried yeah you know, I don't I don't remember what my child eight yesterday, let alone, you know, all the different things that have happened developmentally. So parents are notoriously bad um, reporters. So great question. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, a few different. I mean, so you could you could interpret it from the point of view of they tend to be involved in the same kinds of tasks. You know, from my point of view, they're they're each involved in different aspects of social perception, social cognition. They tend to rise and fall. But even from the point of view of resting state activity, and and you know, one even during rest tends to co-vary with activity in the other. I think they're rising and falling together because there's, there's a meaningful network there. Yes. Um, I think it, from my point of view, it didn't survive motion confounds. That once we kind of nailed that down, I think that fell away. Still different versions of it in terms of um, short range versus long range. And, you know, I'm always, especially like here, when I start talking about long and short range connectivity, looking around at the neuroscientists in the room and functional connectivity, I'm very shy about any of it. I don't even want to show effective connectivity data because, you know, it's not connectivity. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. so that was amazing. Thank you. 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 Thank
boys with high functioning autism. Yes. And if you restrict yourself to boys and high functioning autism, you can you can do diagnostic mm -hmm. separation of the populations and independent data generalizing to these samples. Yes. But then if you add girls or low functioning autism, then the profiles of activation are different and yes. include hyperactivation and also not hypoactivation. Yes. And totally different patterns. So I'm going to try to repeat the question. Yes. Okay. I'm going to try to repeat the question, which is, so, okay, you're saying that in high, um, pe people that are, have high IQs, doing well, well-adapted autism, um, in addition to having autism, boys, they're showing differences in the social perception regions in response to biological and non-biological emotion. That's replicable and in ind independent samples and can be used to quote unquote diagnose, although carefully because I'm not differentiating two different disorders. But the minute you try to apply that to low functioning autism or girls with autism, you get um, a real wrench in things. It doesn't work. It doesn't seem to apply to girls in particular as a group. Um, and for low functioning autism, the initial indication is that they can just as likely be hyper functioning in that area is really surprising, and certainly girls are hyper-functioning in that area, and seem to be kind of like our unaffected siblings, just adding to your question, in that they seem to have extra bits of cortex that you know people like you and I think of as, as higher level types of social cognition that seem to be coming in play, even though they have autism. You know, so uh, by definition, they have social problems. Mm -hmm. also predicts not responding to pivotal response training. Right. So it predicts lower response to pivotal response training, combined with differences in the extent of nucleus accumbens, amygdala, um, activation, differentiating biological and non-biological motion, as well as regions in the insula and orbital frontal cortex, which you know, really encourage me to interpret it as the extent of social motivation, if there's a neural signature of that, is predicting how well you'll do on PRT and, and underneath the surface where clinicians aren't able to pick that up. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, you, we want to know what role language plays in all this. So um, I admittedly don't know how to interpret the following data at all. It's sort of blocking writing this paper. Um, these are the regions that changed as a result of PRT. And these are regions that um, I was looking at um, just Dermot's work this morning, looking at um, uh, temporal coding in speech regions. And you know, these at first blush look to me like language-related areas, auditory cortex, speech processing areas. And I'm like, this is a biological versus non-biological motion task. This had no difference in sound. So what are these kids doing as a result of um, getting PRT? Um, so this is a roundabout way of answering your question in so much as we haven't had enough subjects yet to really differentiate those with and without language in a powerful way. We've got the early data that we need for pilot data to do that. And we're going to put it in an R01. Actually, we put it in once. We're going to resubmit it. Um, where we try to get at that. Because we had to prove, and even after we proved the, the study section said it's impossible to scan minimally verbal kids with autism. And so now we've scanned more, and, and um, hopefully we're about to publish on it. So. We want to know the answer to that. But what it looks like, what I'm most excited about in relation to your question, is that the regions that seem to be changing from my, from the, my clinician friends, so for example, we have Leah Booth, who is a speech language pathologist. She was delighted when she saw this data, because PRT was originally designed as an intervention for language. And you know, we're thinking of it as something that would affect the social responsiveness scale, which certainly, if you improve language,
you're going to improve social communication and parents are really going to notice. So we also see large gains on language in these, uh, in the study. This is the brain regions that are, are sensitive to the change in SRS. I, I realize I'm kind of droning on, but I, I'm kind of thinking of it as I go. It's, I think what we're seeing is one set of brain regions that are related to social motivation, predicting change in another set of brain regions, which are some involved in speech processing and language. How the heck we saw that comparing biological versus non-biological, I don't know, unless the kids are narrating in their heads what the patty cake guy is doing as a result of now being able to. Um, and that, that would amaze me and that all of them are doing it consistently, I don't know. So um, yeah, so I don't really have a good answer for your question other than I think it's a great question. Okay, so uh, Kevin, thank you for a really inspiring talk. Thank you.